today is all about powers and structures, powers and communities. I'm going to start my speech with a very basic question. What makes us feel powerful? Sometimes we think of power as an absolute force that is always derived from strength, from a man's broad and lean shoulders, for instance, or even from deflating promises of politicians promising change, like reducing drug-related crimes, for example, or even lowering the price for gas and oil, or even the promises of a hashtag bagong dipunan or a new society. We grew up thinking that power in and of itself comes with a standard, that we have to be successful to be powerful, that we have to be rich to be powerful, that we need to have an enormous social capital to be powerful. Because at the end of it, who does not want to be powerful anyway? But I have to ask, to whom this power must be directed, and why is it then important to impose this power? Today, we will hope to tie power with the work that we do in our communities. As a development worker, I have seen scratches and tidbits of power being monetized into war guns instead of shelters. I have seen how it curtailed freedom of speech and expression, extending to the massive display of racism and inequality. Worse is that we saw power in the face of real-life ethnic cleansing and genocide happening to our children and women all across our world, witnessing how these children and women never saw the light of day. Today, we will think of power as an abstract concept that lingers as a privilege and an inherent right. I will be delving deeper into the concept of power and fisheries and discuss the powers of the community in liberating them apart from these structures that constrain them to transcend upward. But before I do that, let me have a couple of setup. First, let's talk about the Philippine archipelago because I'm going to posit that the Philippine archipelago is blessed with a wealth of marine resources that extends into having coral reef systems covering around 25,000 square kilometers, housing over 2,000 species of fish and a diverse array of marine life. However, if we're going to look at how it implies into our social lives, these resources are not only ecologically important, but they also serve as vital economic pillars because we're going to look at how our resources are exported outside of our country. Therefore, there's a direct correlation of our production to the economic growth of our country. However, despite this massive contribution, why is it that our our people are still poor. Our fisher folks and farmers who work tirelessly every day, why are they still remaining to be the poorest sector in our country? Most of us love the oceans, the seafood, the beautiful glow of the beach, for example, or even the fact that we wanted to dive in into the ocean. But was there a time in our lives that we grew close to love a fisher folk? to treat them as parts of the oceans we love. I bet the majority of us will say yes. No, no. But when was, when was the last time that we actually talked about how they are living? Not just surviving, living life. We are welcomed in a generation where our families probably here, the majority of us, are living off as moderate income holders where our basic needs are luxurious and everything comes with a price. Who here experienced adding salt, oil, or soy sauce to their rice? In short, sila kagidil del asin with the magic of datu puti and silver swan. If you try it, it's good, right? It's good. But for those who haven't, I want to note that this symbolizes the symbol of our powerlessness, of having nothing but salt of having nothing but a tiny little amount of salt. I'm going to introduce four important pieces that will encapsulate how fisher folks and the concept of power converge. The first piece is very simple, poverty. I'm going to posit that our fisher folks' poverty incidents never recovered from the pandemic, where they sold their fish for 13 pesos per kilo, which is three times the cut of its original price. Government interventions present are limited to ideal technology transfers that are not given even that are not even given to them, but are given to their business operators. So despite their vulnerability to climate change, they were not even given the tools to adapt. 
but they're given relief packs in times of calamities. But ultimately, we have seen how our fisher folks remain to be the poorest sector of our country, despite the fact that we are at the center of marine biodiversity. We are at the center of the center, but at the center of the center, we also have been the center of spilled oils that resulted into the loss of livelihoods and degraded marine ecosystems affecting the lives of our Filipino fishers and coastal communities. And worse is that in our home, we have been feeling unsafe ever since then. It may be considered and branded as a quote-unquote challenge for big commercial fishing vessels, but for our small-scale fisher folks, that meant their lives, their survival, and the dreams that they conceived with their children. Power was harsh. It conditioned them to believe that good things in life are only for those who have real money, when it must be the right to survive, to live and to access basic services. And poverty has enslaved them to believe that their sense of self meant to be just called a fisher folk. Ay, kapang isda ka lang. Ay, fisheries lang na. And this relegated them to their fullest potential without even accessing the chance to break free from poverty. The second piece is very simple, patriarchy. I grew up in a conservative family where my display of softness and femininity resulted in me being targeted by multiple discriminatory remarks. But this is worse for our fisher folk sector. I'm going to posit that the insufferable invisibility embraced by gender minorities, especially women and LGBTQ+, has crippled the right to participate. They do not hold much power in governing mechanisms, let alone be acknowledged that they carry multiple burdens on their back to sustain not just the catch of their husbands, but also to sustain their family. In my recent study focusing on identifying general laws in marine protected area, we're going to posit that men access most of the fisheries resources in marine protected areas, or even in the generality of coastal communities, because of the fact that we have been conditioned to believe that men must be the ones to take control, and that they're the only ones capable of transforming our communities. And the sad fact is that it is most of the time internalized, meaning to say men live up to these roles, displacing women's roles as deprioritized and substandard to any form of roles they're in. It made me realize then that we try to live in a society where our show of force becomes our own testament to power as power is always about dominance. And I'm going to say that power has been taken upon by patriarchy to justify how women behave, how we behave, especially with men's aggression. The third piece is very simple, politics. Our fisheries code contains monumental policies that are supposed to protect our own ecosystems and our people. However, we have lawmakers affirming the need to reclaim coastal areas to mega infrastructure projects. We have seen proposals to limit the, the, the areas of municipal waters to fish in order to, for big corporations to profit. And we have seen how the lack of political will resulted to us appointing a Department of Agriculture secretary who was a fishing tycoon. It's ironic because the state of our fisher folk policies only favor those who are not fisher folks themselves, while our fisher folks remain unheard, remain invisible in the way that society behaves. Some may say that, well, politics only happen one time after we vote. But I'm going to argue that it's not. Hungry, Power-hungry politicians have always been continuing to disempower fisher folks because they thought that it is one way to control their lives and to control the access for the fund of the people, resulting into us having less policies that are localized to the needs of the community that we have. I realized then that power has always been tied with a greed to control through politics. And these stories of coastal area reclamation remain as a threat as it displaces our fisher folks in their own homes, removing them from their communities and being branded by politicians as quote-unquote development. Development for who? However, it's sad. But let's try to give a little bit more hope in this room. Fisher folks, despite everything I previously mentioned, remain steadfast to the fulfillment that they achieve 
the moment they go home with fish on their nets and with food on their tables. I have seen them celebrating the end of closed fishing seasons for sardines and tuna. And it was until that moment that I realized the humility of the fisher folks that we serve. It amazes me that despite having nothing at some point in their lives, if they're willing to help and if they're capable to help, they will. And that is I met power through peace. Peace in the noble work of fisheries and peace in the humble passion we share in redefining our communities. The point of which I am sharing you this is very simple. And that is to say that real people with real names and families have dreams that are thriving to exist in a society that grids and benefits from power. Hence, it is very clear that should we want science and conservation to succeed, we really have to start with our people. And it leads me to my second point on the journey of liberating these special folks. I joined my first non-government organization when I was 16. Through Negasan and Young Leaders Institute Incorporated, I have conceived in me the dream to protect our planet, and until then, to protect the people who protect our planet. We have been working in protection of young people through providing safe spaces to action-driven dialogue, and they welcomed me and told me the vision of power that must be collectively realized by our communities. Working with NYLI, I learned the value of my voice to facilitate change from the range of youth organizations, regional coalitions, and it started to grow even in debate societies, which is blurred. Through NYLI, I have seen a hopeful and empowered fisher folks. I started this program, Tuloy Parin, a comprehensive empowerment program for fisher folk communities, especially on LGBTQ+, that centers on post-harvest fisheries and civic engagement. After which, so these are our community. So we train them and we enable them to realize the potential that they have as a community. After which, I opened a review center focused for aspiring fisheries professionals, together with my colleagues and together with our organization. And just this week, great news has arrived. Kulang siya. Anyways, this project has made me define what matters most to our fisher folks. And that the work that we do will always be noble and humble into the vision of realizing what matters most to our communities. And what can we do in order to alleviate the situations they are in? But what can you do? I'm going to share to you three powers today. These three powers are what to identify as the powers that we can conceive as a community to ensure that we cement our space and we are able to acknowledge our role as part of the vital ecological processes. The first power is the power of choice. I want to posit our expression of choice is our expression of power. You have the chance to determine what matters to you the most in order for you to thrive. The second power is the power of two feet. The power of two feet explains our agency to define what's the next step. The reason why we have two feet is for us to join movements, for us to be part of something that is greater than ourselves. And the power of two feet reminds me that we have to live when it is necessary and we have to stay when it is a must. And the last power is the power of expert. Nothing about us without us. The power of expert recognizes our expertise or our own selves and that this expertise must be considered, respected, and acknowledged into the design of our social systems and policies. This power reminds me of this poem, Invictus, that we are the masters of our faith and the captains of our soul. So why is it that I have shared to you these powers? It's very simple. Because fisher folk communities were not able to exercise these powers as it was taken away from them. They were not able to exercise their power of choice because they're preconditioned to believe that they don't have that active choice, that they have to live with whatever society gives them today. They were not able to exercise their two feet because corporations continue to steal their own waters and it continues to deprive them of their natural resources. And most importantly, they cannot access their power of expert as their job, despite its novelty, is still considered as a poor man's job. And they have to tell their children that reality, that you don't have to be like your father and your mother because we're poor. 
And that is sad. Because as parents, it is the most painful way of telling your child to not become like you. It is sad, and it will continue to be sad. I'm going to posit that that's the reason why we're here and why we continue to do the things that we love. It is because we knew that this pain can be shared and can be collectively remembered that can be, and can be collectively mended through the powers that we will conceive as a community. I hope that we can remember, and that because we need to remember, we need to remember the beauty in the conversations we partake with our communities. We need to remember these stories that were told to us about the marvel of the skies that guides our sailors, about the hearsays of dinoflagellates glistening in the oceans, the folklore about the dolphin siren song, and even the taste of ogang at tabagurk, or salted fish. We need to write and talk about these things because these narratives, this narrative rather, shape the collective and the broader goal to liberate apart from the structures of power that continue to destabilize our empowerment. And ultimately, we need to keep these stories and conversations alive. To give justice to those who we lost, remembering why we lost them. And it will hurt at some point. It will be heartbreaking. But it is an expression of our own power to choose and define what deserves to hurt us like this. As for me, I carry with me the basic concept of ecology that everything is connected to everywhere. And we need to value these interconnectedness as part of natural systems in order for us to be, in order for us to bring back light to where there must be light, to bring back peace and justice to our fisher folks who have been historically disenfranchised because of private corporations and a grade of power hungry politicians. And it is important to remind here and everybody in this room that we have to ultimately bring back the power to our people. We bring back the power to our communities and help them understand that the power in people is always ultimately greater than the people we put in power. And that the narrative can only change should we allow ourselves to become the narrative. So, let me reframe the question I asked you earlier. When was the last time you felt powerful. I hope it starts today. Thanks.